I'm Tim Essington. I'm a professor here in the College of the Environment, and in particular, I am in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. Now, one thing that is also relevant about my job here at the University of Washington is that I'm the director of the Center for Quantitative Sciences. What we do at the Center for the Quantitative Sciences is we provide foundational course training for people pursuing biology, uh, environmental sciences, uh, e economics, anthropology, psychology, you name it, in the application of mathematics and statistics to their particular fields. So you might very well be a student in one of our Center for Quantitative Sciences classes. So what I'm going to do today is really kind of talk about one element, which is the statistical part of it. I'm going to talk about two main things here today. I'm going to talk about one is why do statistics, why is that a thing that everyone needs to learn in the sciences? And then most importantly, I want to focus on why is it hard? In other words, I'm going to get at the fundamental ways that our brains accumulate and process information that often leads us to make errors. So to start off, why do we need this whole thing called statistics in the first place? Well, let's just imagine a scenario. Here in the University of Washington, we work on the quarter system. That means we have 10 weeks of instruction. That means a midterm is commonly in week six. So let's say week five, I show up and I'm feeling a little, little, little uh, uh, like a gambler. And, here, and, I tell, and I tell you all a deal. I said, tell you what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, take this quarter, and I don't have a quarter with me, but let's just say I had a quarter, and I say, I'm gonna flip it. And if I get eight or more heads, you guys have to take the midterm, and I'm gonna make it kinda hard. But if I get fewer than eight heads, no one has to take the midterm. Everyone can just go off and do whatever you want. So some of you may want to take that bet. You may be like, yeah, that sounds great to me because I got a lot on my plate right now. So let's just imagine I started doing that. And let's say uh, we can keep a running tally of the number of times uh, I get a heads and the number of times I get tails. And let's say I flip the first time and it gets heads. Okay, no biggie. Flip it again, I get heads again. Flip it again, I get heads. Flip it again, oh, I get a tail. Flip it again, I get heads. Flip it again, I get heads. Flip it again, I get another tail. Flip it again, I get heads. Flip it again, I get heads. Flip it again, I get heads. Oh no, you guys have to take the hard midterm because I got eight heads just as I promised. And now you guys have to study doubly hard. Okay, now at some point, if this was a real thing, uh, and this was the outcome, you might, you might wonder for a moment. You might wonder, did Professor Essington just want to give an excuse to give a really hard exam? And did he have a trick coin that comes up heads more than 50% of the time? And the reason why you might think that, and, and quite rightly so, is you might think that, boy, getting eight heads and only two tails out of 10 co coin tosses is kind of a weird event if the coin was fair. And that line of thinking is the essence of what we call statistical inference. I'll break that apart. What, about the, what does the inference mean? The inference means you are using the information here in other words, the number of heads and tails, to make an inference, in other words, to make a judgment about what's really going on with this coin of mine. And in this case, you might be making a judgment that my coin is not a fair coin. It doesn't come up heads 50% of the time. Maybe it comes up heads 80% of the time. And it's statistical because you're thinking about what's the probability or likelihood of getting this outcome if it was a fair coin. And because it seems kind of like an unusual outcome, you are using those statistical properties to make an inference. And when you think about it, that's all of what science kind of does, is we have observations, and we want to make inferences from that. And to do that, we have to apply statistics. So that's the why of statistics. This is why our brains are bad at statistics. Our brains have evolved, understandably, to cope with this situation. Here is a bear that I'm pretty sure wants to eat me. And I have to make some decisions incredibly quickly in order, to, in order to avoid that happening. 
So our brains have developed cognitive shortcuts that allow us to make decisions really, really quickly when we don't have time to deeply contemplate all of the odds and probabilities of things, et cetera, et cetera. And why the, the reason why they're problematic is while they're super useful in the situation of this bear coming right at me, they're completely unhelpful when we need to apply calm, cool decision making, and particularly when it comes to applying classic rules of probability. In fact, most of the time, they steer us in the wrong direction. So we're going to talk about these things called heuristics. Heuristics are just mental shortcuts to decision making. We all have them, and they're particularly important when you need to make a decision really fast. When you don't have time to think through the problem in a very analytical way. Uh, this is a really dated example, uh, but I wanted to keep the original wording as, as close as I can. And this was kind of written in the 1980s, so you can hear what people were sort of thinking about. So Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy, and as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination, social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. That was the thing that we did back then. Okay, so just based on what you know about Linda right here, uh, rank the following statements by the probability of them being true, where one is the most probable and eight is the least probable. A, Linda's a teacher in a primary school. B, Linda works in a bookstore and takes yoga classes. C, Linda is an active feminist. D, Linda is a psychiatric social worker. E, Linda is a bank teller. F, Linda takes yoga classes. G, Linda is a bank teller and is an active feminist. I'm going to let you pause this for 20 seconds, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. So pause right now. And welcome back. OK, so you did your rankings. So uh, I'm really interested to know if you were tempted at all, or maybe even did it, um, by making this, this oh, I missed my asterisks here, this one right here, so B. How many of you, uh, just if you rank that one, is more likely than this one? So one is Linda takes yoga classes. The other is Linda takes yoga classes and she works in a bookstore. What these researchers found is most people tend to say this is more likely than that. And that is caused by what they call the availability heuristic. So you assign probabilities to things based on how easily, in other words, how available they are in your brain for you to imagine them. And as it turns out, as you add more and more detail, you can more easily imagine them, and therefore that, that image is more available in your brain, and it seems more likely. Where does that lead you wrong? Well, it leads you to ex the exact wrong answer. Because if you think about this as all the world of all the people represented by this box, and I can put in here all of the uh, people who work in bookstores, that's this circle right here, then I'll make a circle of all the people in the world who uh, are active in yoga, and maybe it looks something like that. Well, the number of people that are both is the overlap. And the overlap can never exceed the size of any one of these circles, right? It's impossible. So whenever you start in probability speak, whenever you start putting in and statements, you should be reducing the probability of something being right. But our brain does the exact opposite. It makes them seem more likely. OK, so I just told you statistics is going to be hard because of these ways our brains are wired. So what are you going to do about it? First, be patient with yourself. You have to. Second, and maybe the most important, is expect to make mistakes. And not only are you making these mistakes, but people who are teaching you this material are also making the same mistakes. When people develop this theory, when they applied the same questions to people who were professors in statistics, they made the same mistakes as incoming college freshmen. It's, it's just how our brains are wired. So expect to make mistakes, and then be able to be in a position to correct them. And then just remember that there are these two ways of thinking. And just pay a lot of close attention to, do you think, am I using the fast, I hope I don't get eaten by this bear brain? Or are you using the, I'm a slow, rational, think through the problem kind of thinker brain? 
So if you're in the middle of doing your statistics homework or your statistics midterm, and you think you're using the don't be eaten by a bear part of your brain, just tell that part of your brain to shut up for a minute. 